the solution to Newton's puzzle, you know, how the planet, how the orbits of the planets can remain so stable for so long, was worked out about a century later by a French mathematician. And Newton was perfectly capable, definitely competent to do that himself if he had just had an, a sufficiently open mind and the curiosity to say, okay, maybe I can solve this. Maybe this isn't magic. Maybe it isn't right. God. Maybe right. this is just a little bit more difficult in the way of mathematics. Let me work on this some more. To support Growing Up Funding or any of my other various projects, find me on Patreon under Sydney Davis Jr. Jr. Thanks for listening. Well, Dr. John Wathy, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing very well, thank you. Glad to be with you. Glad to be with you as well. Thank you so much for taking your time to come on this podcast and share your thoughts and opinions and and your experiences with me and with my listeners. I really appreciate it. I have loved deep diving into your content this week, and I'm excited to hear it kind of from you firsthand. But um, with that, give us a give us an intro. Who are you? What do you do? What are you about? Well, I am definitely a science nerd. I've, I've loved science for as, as long as I can remember, as, as, for, as, for as long as I've had any inkling of, of what science was, I've loved it. Um, I can remember watching Walt Disney episodes. He used to have this TV show back in the 50s and, and 60s about all kinds of stuff. But one of the things he did was a few shows on space travel. And I love those. I just yeah. ate that up. So, and that was the age when space travel was starting to become real. It wasn't just science fiction anymore. So, right. So, I, so, so I'm a science nerd. But I, I, uh, I got my biology degree at Caltech and uh, a, degree, a PhD in neuroscience at UC San Diego. And now I'm retired. I'm, I'm just um, Good for doing, you. The kind, doing the kind of things that old scientists do, which is to, to write books that are a little more speculative or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, um, but most of what I did in my career was uh, what I call computational biology, which to me just means using computers to try to solve some interesting problem in biology that can be approached with computers and algorithms and simulation. So, um, so that was my career. But um, now I'm, I'm pursuing something that I've been interested in all my life also, so something very non-scientific, some might even say anti-scientific, which is religion. Where, what <laughs> is it? Where does it come from? Why, why do we do this to ourselves? Um, and so that, that, in a nutshell, is kind of what I am. Oh, I should maybe also mention that I'm a nature lover, right? I enjoy being out in the wilderness and hiking and stuff like that, which kind of goes with science and biology. Oh, yeah, I would say. I feel like our first exposure to science as kids is that first field trip where we go. Maybe it's out in the woods or on a hike of some sort, and we study frogs and leaves and things like that. Um, That's very interesting. Now, I read in your bio that you were raised by a Catholic parent and a Presbyterian parent. So do you think that kind of co-religious background has anything to do with why you're interested now in religions and studying them the way you are? I think it probably does. Um, For many years, I I didn't think it was all that unusual. And I guess my parents tried to make us think that our family wasn't unusual in that respect. But but it, it really was different because every my I, I should say that I, I went to my dad's church almost every Sunday. Um, he's a Protestant. Um, the, when a, a, a Protestant marries a Catholic, they the Catholic Church wants them to raise all the children Catholic. And my parents bent that rule just a little bit <laughs> by letting me go to my dad's church and be a Presbyterian with him while all the rest of the kids in the family went to my mom's church and were raised as Catholics. Oh, so you were the only one that went with him? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. What do you think that was about? What do you think happened there? Um, you know, it's. I think it may have created a little bit of sibling rivalry in some ways that 
people thought uh, my siblings felt that I was closer to my dad or I was my dad's favorite. There's, there's a little bit of that. Yeah. But um, every once in a while, I'd go to my mom's church too, because my dad would be out of town on a business trip or something and on a Sunday. And so I'd go with my mom and I would see a Catholic mass, which back then was conducted in Latin and, and was right. just gibberish to me. It meant right. Nothing. right. right. <laughs> and there were, they have lots of elaborate rituals that we don't have in a Presbyterian church, lots of candles and genuflecting and all this yes. stuff that seemed very strange to me as a kid. Yes. So, so I could see it was my first chance of seeing a religion sort of as an outsider. I was seeing Catholicism specifically as someone who is not a Catholic. And it, it, to me, as a naive kid, it looked strange. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, yeah. I am sure that if, it, if I had gone the other direction, been raised in my mom's church, and every once in a while I went to my dad's church, it would look just as strange, right. but for, for different reasons. So, so, so that... I think may have sown a few seeds of doubt in my mind, even way back then when I was a little right? kid. I can imagine. But I didn't start seriously doubting religion until I was about 14 or 15, somewhere in there. And I didn't immediately disbelieve in the existence of God, but I did start to see that Christianity can't possibly be true. Right. That that, that there, there are just too many contradictions, that we're, we're told that God is perfectly loving and forgiving and, and, um, and omniscient and omnipotent. So in a world like that, if God really loves us, we should not have a bunch of meaningless suffering in the world. But, right. But we Absolutely. Do. It's, it's right. everywhere. And this was when the Vietnam War was raging. This was in the news all the time. So I think that got me to realize that, okay, if God exists, maybe there is a God, but he either doesn't care about us <laughs> or he's cruel and is trying to make us suffer. <laughs> right, right. Absolutely. So, so Christianity can't be right. And then I went to church, continued to go to church uh, with my dad for a, about a year after I started to have those revelations, if you can call it, or insights, however you want to put it. And that, in a way, was even more disturbing to me, just going to church and pretending to believe it, pretending yes. to be a Christian, parroting all the things I knew they expected me to say in Sunday school, for example. And I just felt I was being dishonest. It was, it was an act of hypocrisy on my part, and I didn't yeah. want to do that. I, I felt like my dad had raised me to be honest. Right. And this was being dishonest. So at, at age almost 16, not quite 16, I confronted my dad about that and told him I just didn't think I could keep doing this anymore. I don't believe it. I, I can't do it. And at first he was accepting of it. But then after a few days when he it sunk in that he would be going to church alone and he would no. have to explain to his friends why I wasn't going, that it would be a big embarrassment to him. And uh, anyway... Then he kind of wanted to try to force me to go to church, and, and that did not go well. <laughs> so, right, right, I can imagine. We, yes. we had a, a bit of a confrontation, but, you know, I, I trusted in my dad enough that um, I knew he wasn't going to kick me out of the house or anything drastic like that. That That's happens. Good. That does happen to some young people, I know. but That happens to a lot of young people. Yeah, yeah. So many people. Yeah, but I, I, I kind of knew that would not happen to me, and it didn't. And we did eventually heal the rift between us that opened up because of that, but um, it took years. I was going to say, how long did that take? It, yeah, you know, yeah, like a it, decade or more? More, really. In, in, a, in a sense, you know, we, we, got past the, we got past the initial chasm, I would say, in, within five years, which was partly my becoming – you know, no longer a teenager and starting to be an adult. It was right. growing, growing out of adolescent rebellion. That right. Adolescent rebellion was just part of it. But, right. but my parents really never accepted that I didn't believe in God. They were always, every once in a while, sending me clippings from the newspaper of Billy Graham's articles, you know, saying, oh, you should read this. Don't you think this is just a great argument or whatever? Always trying to persuade me to get me to see the light. 
but um, right. they, I could never get them to just accept it. Yeah, I think that a lot of religious parents, when they find out that their kids are either not religious or bordering on not religious, I think they take it as a as a critique on them as how they raised their children. Like they somehow failed their kids or they failed God or they failed the church. And so that's why the reaction is often so visceral, you know, so like desperate to to keep their kids involved. And some people even go so far as to kick out their relatives because yeah. instead of actually worrying about their salvation, which I think is part of it, they're more worried about what did I do wrong? What will people think of me? What will the church think of my abilities as a parent? Oh my gosh. And then they kind of yeah. spiral from there. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting. That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about your siblings? Did they go through anything similar or were they pretty devout? Um, you know, um, I don't think any of my siblings is devout today. Um, I think in, in some ways it was, it was easier for them to rebel against Catholicism just because Catholicism was so strange. My, my youngest brother, I remember, at one point told my mom that, um, you know, I don't understand what they're saying in these, in these masses. Why, why am I going to this church? Right. It, doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. But he just had the, I don't know, the gumption to just be completely straightforward. Right. So, so he, st he, he actually quit the church at a younger age than I did. Wow. But um, That's brave, I feel like. I, yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and, but maybe it was because he knew that I had sort of paved the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he had already seen me do it. So They're just like, oh, another one. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. dang it. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. And so did your kind of segue into your studies – did that also harm any relationships you had with people in your life? Like the more that you kind of pursue this idea of, is God real? Probably not. Here's science that proves it, et cetera. Has that, did that ever kind of heal the rift with your parents or was that always kind of present or did, were they around when you entered that phase of your studies? That's a, that's a good question. Very insightful question. I've, I've often wondered whether, I could have, you know, sat down and had a long conversation with my mom and dad about the books I've written. Um, they were still alive when I started to write the first book, which was around 2007. Um, but they are—they were really gone mentally. My, they were both sliding into dementia, yeah. so it was kind of hopeless even then. They, they could never have understood what I was writing at that at that age so it was already too late and they were devout pretty much until the end of their lives as well um, yeah yeah they were and to you know to the extent that they i i don't know how to how to answer that question for my mom because my mom was so severely demented by the by by the time of her death that wow. i don't think she even had much of a concept of god anymore i she didn't know who I was. <laughs> right. She, you know, so, you know, her mind was just gone by then. Was, she just very gradually died as her yeah. brain very gradually died. Which then, incidentally is just as an aside is one of the arguments I make in my first book for the unity of mind and brain. I was that, about to ask if her experience had any impact on your research or your findings or anything like that and it, not exactly except to confirm what i had already known about about dementia and and the unity of mind and brain what one you um you were interested i as i recall in sort of when i started becoming yes. not not religious what kind of insights did i have early on yeah. when i was making that transition one of them came um some years after I had, had a few years after I'd had the split with my parents, I had graduated high school and started at first. I, for my first year out of high school, I went to a junior college. It was close by. It was easy to do. I wanted to um, explore some sciencey things, and and I was studying mathematics and electronics and things like that in junior college. And electronics, in particular, 
was fascinating to me. I was always a tinkerer and I love gadgets and I love playing with electronics and electrical circuitry and transistors and stuff like that. So I was, I was into that and doing that and thinking about it. And I had my, I bought my first pocket calculator then. Those were a, a new thing then. That's great. Um, they, they were like the, the dazzling technology of the day. <laughs> and, uh, and somewhere along that time, it occurred to me that if I take my pocket calculator and put it on the floor and stomp on it and crush it, to just destroy all of the circuitry in it, it's not a calculator anymore. It doesn't do any calculation anymore. It's useless. And I thought that that, that it just seemed obvious, that little insight made it seem obvious to me that that's what happens in death. Mm-hmm. That our, our, our brains, our, 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 what we think of as our minds, what some people call their souls, but what we think of as our conscious minds, our memories, our feelings, our experiences, right. everything we call ourselves, all of that is a function of activity in the brain and in the circuitry of the brain and the interaction between neurons and the neurochemical stuff that goes on in the brain. And when that dies, it's like, you know, taking a computer and stomping on it and crushing it and just destroying it. And right. it's not a computer anymore. Right. Not, when the brain dies, it's not a person anymore. And, right. Absolutely. And- Absolutely. My first, um, when I first started to kind of question, you know, and deconstruct, I could not in my brain fathom, even though I, I figured I, I was starting to kind of figure out and, and believe that everything like lights out when you're done lights out. I just couldn't wrap my mind around what that kind of absolute feeling could be like. And then one day I was put under anesthesia uh-huh. and they said, count back from 100. I said 100 and I woke up six hours later. Yeah. And well, it didn't seem like six hours. It right. seemed like an instant later. It seemed like a blink. And I realized like, oh, there really is a point where you can be, because you always think, you don't even realize you think this, but you always think it's going to be blackness for that amount of time. And your thoughts are kind of still going to be there. It'll be like closing your eyes, but it's lights out. And yeah. I feel like, do you find the more that you explore this like non-existence of an afterlife, non-existence of heaven, does that bring you comfort about the end of your life? Does it bring you anxiety? Do you feel indifferent? How does your beliefs impact how you feel about your demise? For me, it's actually very comforting. It's, um, it's not, some people find it terrifying. Yes. Um, Woody Allen famously said, um, he wants to achieve immortality by not dying. <laughs> he, um, right. Not not through his work, not through his movies or whatever, but but through not dying. Just through <laughs> because not dying. The, the the abyss, the thought of, of being in this blackness for eternity terrifies him. But right. it doesn't it doesn't bother me at all because um, as I think um, Mark Twain put it, the the, the eons that come after my death will be just as unpleasant or inconvenient to me as the eons that preceded my birth. You know, that's, right. we, we've had billions of years of, of non-existence prior to being born. We'll have billions of years of non-existence after we die. There's no difference between the two as far as conscious experience goes in my judgment. <laughs> and do you think that, um, I read once that somebody thought maybe it was a survival tactic that our brains make us forget about dying eventually, because otherwise we would just be standing here kind of panicking all the time. Do you think that's true? Or do you think that's more just people not being able to understand what unconsciousness truly is? Well, I would say that, first of all, there is good reason for our brains and our minds to want very much not to die. Right. All, it's, all that's animals, like a natural instinct for sure. All animals try to avoid death because if they didn't, they wouldn't leave um, offspring and their genes right. would not be in the gene pool anymore. So, so there's definitely a genetic basis for that much. Um, how we cope with it though, the, the thing that's, probably distinguishes humans from most other animals is that we we have this immense power immense capacity for imagination 
for seeing the future and thinking about the future. Um, and we can very easily imagine that there will come a time when we die. We, it's hard not to do that at some point in life. Right. And, and so, so how, do you, how do you cope with that? Because death really does evoke visceral, unconscious aversion because of these instincts the, to avoid death. You, you right. want to avoid it because, because you won't leave any genes if you don't have this gut feeling that you must yeah. avoid it. So you must have an aversion to it, and that aversion is unpleasant. So the more you think about your own death, it can be emotionally unpleasant. So how do you cope with that? Well, you can try not to think about it, just concentrate on the present day-to-day stuff. Some people do that. You can just deny it. You can come up with a story, a mythology, a belief system that that just tells you the opposite. Oh, no, you actually, you don't die. It's just a transition. You'll go off to another, another life, an afterlife, or you'll be reincarnated as another person or some other being in this life, but, you know, another cycle. People come up with myths like that to make death sort of go away, and, and they've found comfort that way. Um, but for me, just knowing that I'll wink out of existence. I've I've made my peace with that. For me, I'm I'm quite comfortable with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when I try to think about it, I think I worry more about the way that I die versus dying. It's not death. It's some of these things you read about on the news and you're just like, oh, I I never want that to happen to me, right? Um, Which came first, your interest in the human mind, your interest in evolution, or your interest in religion? I imagine religion was probably the later one, right? Well, well, let's see. Prob- you know, religion probably entered my mind before any of the others because my dad started taking me to Sunday school at age four. Um, wow, that's so young. So, yeah. So, so I was indoctrinated from since age four. And I have to say that I actually kind of liked it at first because there were some cute girls in the Sunday school class. <laughs> yes. Yo. And, and I, it's when I learned flirting. I learned more about flirting than, than yeah. I learned about Jesus in, in Sunday school in the first year. But, right. um, but yes, I, so, I, so in that very sh- shallow, superficial way, I started to be indoctrinated f- in religion first. But like I said, as as a kid, I, I, I got uh, some, some science from TV, some science from the space race that was starting to happen. And my dad was very interested in science, too. He was a chemist by profession, and he was interested oh, in wow. space exploration. He got me a telescope when I was still a kid, and we would go out and look at the stars together. I loved that. I really enjoyed that. And you, you could see... You know, the rings around Saturn, not at high resolution or anything, but you could tell it was a ring. That was, that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I guess science started soon after religion for me. And there, were all, there was always a tension between the two. Um, and that, that tension just grew as, as I learned more and more about science and more and more about religion, actually, and more and more about the way the real world works as opposed to the way the Christianity tells you the yeah. world works, which are not the same. And how do you think your your dad formulated a career in science and also maintained devout belief? What do you think? Did he ever happen to talk about it? You know, we uh, when he when I was young, when I, and when I was young enough to still be going to church with him, we did talk about that. And back then, he actually had a very sophisticated outlook on that. He was not a young earth creationist. He believed in evolution. He described evolution as God's way of making life happen. Right. Very much along the lines of Francis Collins, the the famous geneticist who's written a book about his religious beliefs. Um, So he actually had a very subtle uh, view of science and religion and tried to harmonize them in his mind. Now, in later years, um, he spent more time as an old person at home watching religious programs on TV than he did going to church. And I think he was 
less in touch with the latest things in science then too. And he was hearing a lot of fundamentalist preachers on TV. And, and then he did start to swallow young earth creationism and become skeptical of the reality of evolution and all of that. But when he was young and sharp, he, he actually tried very hard to meld the two in his mind. And he was not at all anti-scientific, which was yeah. good for me. Because, right. because that's where my love of science largely came from, was, was him, from his influence. Right. That was one of the more surprising things that I read on your bio was that your dad had encouraged you so much with your interest in science, because I feel like there is this idea, which is not entirely unfounded, but is somewhat unfounded that religious parents will often try to squash your pursuit of science and truth and meaning. And to an extent, I, I think a little bit of that is true in terms of skepticism, in terms of the anything where science kind of what sort of deviates from religion. But there's also like these parents very much like your dad, who is very encouraging. You know, he himself is a scientist. He was probably very excited that you were, you know, as excited about science as he was. But yeah, I definitely think there's this, especially for people who do, now you didn't grow up in the South or you did. I grew up in the South, but I was not born there. And my parents were not from there. My dad was from Rhode Island. My mom was from New York. So they, they were not, um, as immersed in the kind of deep South Bible belt flavor of Christianity as right. a, lot, a lot of people are as, right. as your parents probably were. So yeah. <laughs> it's so, so that helped, I think that, that, that my dad especially was from, from the North. Now my mom was heavily indoctrinated in Catholicism. Um, she grew up in an orphanage. She, she was wow. orphaned at the age of six, but her parents died of tuberculosis. Oh, that's terrible. This, this was almost a hundred years ago. I was going to say this, that must've been a while yeah, ago. Yeah. They, they were Polish immigrants and, and lived in New York in poverty. And a lot of people who lived in tenements or poor, poor places, you know, poverty, new, poor neighborhoods got tuberculosis back then and died of it. So um, her parents did. And, she and her sisters were brought up in an orphanage. Wow. So, so she, it was a Catholic orphanage. So she had Catholicism pounded into her yes. all, all day long, <laughs> yeah. all day long. So she, she was very deeply into it, but Catholicism isn't all that specifically anti-scientific either, but it isn't all that pro-scientific. It is interesting that somebody who grew up in a Catholic orphanage would marry somebody who wasn't Catholic. If anything, I would think that was against all of her sensibilities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah she used to tell a joke, um, which you may have heard, um, that um, I hope I can get it right. Um, I, th it's, I, I don't remember the, the exact joke, but it's, it's something about uh, a Catholic mother who, um, who her, her son uh, goes off and no, no, I think it's her daughter. Her, her, she, found, she finds out that her, her daughter has become a, a prostitute. She's told somehow that her daughter has become a prostitute and she passes out on the floor unconscious and her friends try to revive her and everything. And she says, oh, Lord, did, did, did I hear correctly? <laughs> did I really hear that? And, and, and someone tells, yes, I'm sorry, but your daughter is a prostitute. Oh, prostitute. Oh, praise God. I thought you said Protestant. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. I haven't heard that one, but I'm going to put that one in my, my little notes here. That's funny. It's like, oh, prostitute. Oh, thank God. Oh, do your thing. <laughs> that's really funny um but anyway you, that's that's true they they're, they're it was to, it was taboo for for that to happen was, do, you, do you remember like what when they were raising you guys did they ever like argue about you know what's going to happen to our kids after they die or like what like do did they ever have those discussions in front of you or no not that i can remember and um i think they may have deliberately tried to avoid I was going to Talk, say, probably. Talking about differences between the two flavors of Christianity because <laughs> they, they just didn't want, you know, the more you look at that, the, the, the more difficult it becomes to answer the questions, I think. And, and maybe they just didn't want to have to explain why the two religions are so different. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, it just never came up really. 
And they, they tried to avoid it. But did they get married in a Catholic mass? They did get married in a Catholic church. And um, I think though, they first, they had, they got married twice. They had, they got married um, in a justice of the peace, a secular wedding first. And that was sort of their official marriage. But my mom wanted to have a marriage in the Catholic church. And they, mm -hmm. I think the reason they, they did it that way was that at first they, they tried to find a Catholic priest who would marry them. And, and most of them refused. They wouldn't do it because my dad was Protestant. They wow. just would, would not do it. Yeah. So, so they went ahead and got married with this secular ceremony. And then they eventually did find a priest who would do it. Um, wow. But they had to say that they would raise the kids Catholic. Wow. That's, for, for that that's wild. That, I mean, it's entirely believable, but you just forget sometimes that the world was like that at, yeah. at a certain time. Like, you know, it was, but just hearing it is just so interesting. Yeah, and, was, and they used to do like sorry, blood that, tests and stuff too, right? Oh, yes, yes. This was 1948. Yeah. So that's wow. how long ago it was. Wow. Do you remember any point in your exploration of religion um, where you were like, boom, this is it. This is what I needed to find in order to solidify my disbelief that none of this is real or your kind of like golden ticket where you're like, finally, I'm finding legitimate, whether it's information or maybe you saw something or maybe you read something that just really clicked for you. You know, um, that, that, I think the closest I could come to that is that uh, that moment of insight when I was describing the thought experiment of stomping on my pocket calculator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that may come closest to being that moment for me, even though, you know, I had stopped being religious years before then. Um, I, but I went through a phase, I went through years when I didn't call myself an atheist. Right. I wasn't sure whether there was a God or not. I was sure if there is such a thing, it's not the God I've been taught, told right. about in, in any of my upbringing. But that insight probably was the, the final nail in the coffin for me, where I not only ceased to believe in, in the existence of a God, but I ceased to believe in any kind of afterlife at all. And, and more than that, I felt that the way to understand everything that I, I need or want to understand, the way if I, anything I, I want to understand about reality, about the world, about other people, about myself, about human psychology, any of that, if I'm, if I'm going to get any answers, they have to come from science. That's right. the way to get the answers. And, right. and maybe it can't answer some of the questions I want to answers to, but then I just have to live with with unanswered questions. <laughs> right. I, Because I, I feel like with religion, it is, nobody is ever telling you an answer. You either believe what you're told, or you believe that it will eventually come to you. But at no point do you actually get your tangible proof that you need. Whereas at least with science, 50% of the time, you'll get, you know, that tangible evidence that you need. And then the rest of the time, you can actually bank on perhaps technology or, you know, research will, will increase or, or what's the word I'm looking for will raise in value and, and quality. And I'll be able to eventually get that. Even mm -hmm. if I can't right now, we'll make telescopes that can see smaller or further. We'll make, you know, all of these strides. So I, I know that a lot of people, their argument for being religious is, well, at least I will, the worst case scenario, I'll get to the end of my life and find that this was all for nothing, but at least I did it. Or I'll get to the end of my life and find out I did the right thing. Those are my only options. Like I win, win. But in my mind, it's at least with science, I get my answers. At least yeah. with science, I'm not perpetually confused. I'm interested. I'm intrigued. I'm driven to continue looking. But I don't want to live in that perpetual confusion. Yeah. Whereas you have to if you decide that you're going to stay religious. Yeah, and there's there's more to it than 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 uh, you know. You're talking. You you were mentioning the religious person saying, yeah, you know, well, if I die and it turns out there isn't a god, then I haven't lost anything, right? But but if I die and it turns out there is, 
and I didn't believe in God, then I go to hell or whatever. That's, but that's I, Pascal's wager. Right. And I still feel like they lose so much. They just don't think about it. Yes, they do. And um, Pascal's wager is, is one of the stupidest ideas <laughs> you, you, you come across when debating with religious people. It's, it's um, first of all, they, they offer it as a reason for believing in God, but it's really just a reason for pretending to believe in God. <laughs> right. Um, that's all it is. And it, it ignores so much. First of all, the fact that there are many, many religions, that, there are not just two choices. You know, we, how do you, there, there, humans have invented thousands of different religions. How do you know that Christianity is the right one? Right, right. <laughs> or, that you, or that you have the right denomination of Christianity. Right. So, so, so there's that. And then there's the problem that um, I just heard an interesting um, lecture from um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's on the internet. It was, it's from a talk he gave at the Salk Institute in 2006. I've, I've heard it long ago, but I just watched it again recently. Uh, and I and I cite it in in, in my talks and in my book in, in various places. He's making the case that some of the greatest scientific minds in history have you know had brilliant insights in physics and mathematics, like Isaac Newton, for example. And then they get to a point where they're having trouble and they they're confronted with something they don't understand and, and a puzzle they can't solve. A, a gap in their understanding and they put god in that gap and they say okay this 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 stability of the orbits of the planets in the case of newton this is something i can't explain with my mathematics the, how all, how this complex thing could work so perfectly and be stable and harmonious planets not crashing into one another or whatever right god must do this god is making this work so well and Neil's point was that as soon as you do that, you shut down scientific inquiry. Yes. He said absolutely. that the solution to Newton's puzzle, you know, how the planet, how the orbits of the planets can remain so stable for so long, was worked out about a century later by a French mathematician. And Newton was perfectly capable, definitely competent to do that himself if he had just had an, a sufficiently open mind and the curiosity to say, okay, maybe I can solve this. Maybe this isn't magic. Maybe it isn't right. God. Maybe right. this is just a little bit more difficult in the way of mathematics. Let me work on this some more. Newton right. could have done that a hundred years earlier, but religion kept him from doing it. Right. Absolutely. We were talking earlier before um, the, like the official episode started about cults and like, I was telling you kind of like my opinion on what constitutes a cult. And I feel like at any point when you are discouraged from asking questions or learning because the people you're asking are worried that anything you find might prove them wrong or might poke holes in their logic or might lead you to research more stuff that's problematic for them, that's dangerous. It's so dangerous because not only does it make people live their lives in a way that they think this this afterlife is waiting for them and their entire lives are dedicated to doing what they have to do in order to behave correctly to win that prize but it's dangerous just from a scientific standpoint so many i think medical inventions and and research discoveries would not exist if people had stopped where they were given that, you know, that ultimatum, if people had stopped where they were being questioned or they were being ridiculed or they were being told, you know, like, oh, stop with that nonsense. What's with this nonsense? We may not have modern medicine to the extent oh, that yeah. we know it today. Right. And so when I tell people, you know, that's dangerous, they're like, oh, you're being dramatic. There's nothing dangerous about God. There's nothing dangerous about the Bible. But when it, when it in discourages people in some aspects, not in all, to not continue to ask questions and to be curious and to learn and to just fill that those gaps with God. Like how many people would be dying right now in the hospital waiting for God to save them? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up because I I worry about that a lot in, in another sense or in another way, which is that religion trains people to to, to, to lose contact with reality. It, 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 
It trains people not to think skeptically. You, you're, you don't want to face the possibility that God might not exist. You, when, you know, when your prayers are not answered, when your loved one dies of cancer despite your prayers, you are trained to, to, to write it off as the Lord works in mysterious ways. It's, it's God's plan and we can't comprehend it, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you're trained to dispel any doubt in your mind, to, to, to shun skepticism. Right. Where, whereas science does the opposite. In science, you embrace skepticism. You're skeptical of everything. You're always trying to find alternative ways to explain things. Even, your, even, even if you come up with some favorite hypothesis that you think is just elegant and, oh, this is wonderful, you're, you're trained to say, okay, yes, that's wonderful, but is there something else that could explain it? How can right. I, how can I distinguish between that something else and this favorite hypothesis? So, um, so religious people are trained to do the opposite of that, and they they lose the ability to think probabilistically because of that. Um, and you know, you if you think probabilistically about religion, you have to say, well, you know, I've never actually seen a miracle, and I don't know of people being raised from the dead. <laughs> it kind of never happens. Right. Um, the, the Red Sea parting, that seems a little, a bit of a stretch. Um, if, you, if, you, if you don't have that, if, you've, if you deliberately suppress that and, and, and lose that ability to think probabilistically and skeptically, then you become vul vulnerable to all kinds of First of all, you become vulnerable to scammers, to, to people who are out to defraud you of your money. Yes. Just because, you know, if you're, if you're not skeptical, and, and especially if the person passes themselves off as being part of your religion, yes. says, says the right words about Jesus and everything, and don't you really want to invest in this wonderful whatever it is that I'm offering yes. you? Um, then you're you're more, more vulnerable to being scammed. So there's that. Yes. You're also unable to see through obvious lies yes. that politicians tell. And we are now going through a time when a po prominent politician has told people this huge, blatant, bald-faced lie that he won the election that he actually lost right. in 2020. And his followers, many of whom are evangelical Christians, are at a disadvantage in trying yes. to see through that lie. So now our, we're actually, as a nation, at risk of losing our democracy because of this. And it worries me a lot. I've tried to reach out to my friends who are like this, and I cannot get through to them. I, I, right. I, I beg them to watch the recorded hearings of the January 6th committee. Yes. And they refuse. They just will not look at it because right. it, it goes against what they want to believe. And, and that's how they've dealt with religion. Yep. Uh, anything that comes along that looks like it, you know, like, like, a, like a, a book written by an atheist, for example, they won't read it. <laughs> that's, no. blas that's blasphemy. That, that could cause doubts. I don't want to see it. I don't want <laughs> yeah. to it. And you're like, do you hear you? It could cause doubts. <laughs> Do you hear yourself? <laughs> like yeah. it could disprove. Yeah, it's it's um, it's interesting. I uh, interviewed a gentleman recently who escaped three cults. He mm -hmm. was raised within one, and when he left, he got basically sucked into two different groups. And we were talking about how you think because you have split from that initial group, that initial cult, or whether it's your fraternity or that MLM or that online scam, you think that you, oh, I've know the signs now I'm impenetrable. When really what you've done is you've opened that wound and a lot of people can see it. And you've actually made yourself kind of like a big walking red flag for anybody who wants to prey on you. You, you think you've gained like all this strength and you're, you're never going to fall for that again. When really in reality, you're so vulnerable because now you don't have that supportive group you don't know what to believe you don't know who to follow and that's all you've ever done is follow and so the first time you see somebody that looks you know he looks bold he looks brave like 
our former president, he says what people are afraid to say, and he says it out loud. And, and when you meet somebody like that, or you see somebody like that, you're like, wow, how dynamic, instead of listening to what they're saying, you're just looking at the power and the gusto and the strength that they're saying it. And, th- and that's just so attractive to people who are not used to thinking on their own and questioning things like, hmm, like, hmm, what? that doesn't make any sense. Right. And, um, and I, and I'm not saying that anybody who's ever been part of a religion is just going to get, you know, sucked down a straw and like taken advantage of, but the statistical likelihood that this is probably happening to them in multiple areas of their life is probably pretty high. They're probably buying products from friends whose feelings they don't want to hurt, you know, whether it's leggings or candles, they're probably married to somebody who, they probably wouldn't have stayed with, but they were kind of told, you know, this is the best you're going to do. Here's all the great things about this guy or this woman. There's no reason on paper you shouldn't like them. You're actually selfish if you don't like them because they're perfect. So, and so you think, oh, I've left that ability to get manipulated behind. But what you don't realize is probably the vast majority of the segments of your life that you currently live right now are being manipulated in some way. And, and I think a lot of people, the reason to your point, the reason why they don't want to read that book, they don't want to look at that article. They don't want to this, they don't want to that is maybe they can't articulate it this way. But I think the reason they avoid looking at those things is because it will expose them. They'll read it and they'll, they'll see themselves either in the problematic aspects like, oh, we're talking about these type of people. Well, I'm not a bad person because I do this. Or they'll see themselves in the questions and the skepticism that they've secretly always had, but they've been told that's the devil, that's sin, that's the, you know, we are always told the devil will make you ask questions. So when you naturally come up with questions, that's the devil. We knew it. We knew you were weak. And so I think that's why they avoid reading those articles, watching those videos, exposing themselves to anything that could possibly prove them wrong because it's less about being proved wrong and more about being proven the fool and more about being proven weak and uh, the ability to be taken advantage of. When in reality, what they could do is they could read those things and consume those things and turn it around starting today. It's never too late, you know? Um, And I also think a lot of people, when they hit like a midlife point, they do think it's too late. Like, why would I stop going to church when I've been going for 40 years? Why would I divorce my spouse when we've been married for 40 years? Like, why would I, I might as well, et cetera, et cetera. Like, why would I go back to school and get that higher degree? Yeah. There's, there's a lot of those forces um, that make it hard to, to break free of, of religion at that point in life. And people are very good at rationalizing and they will find a way to rationalize their belief, even if at some deeper level they know there is no Jesus. This this can't be true. Right. Or even if they literally see the so one of the things I should not have I should not have stoked this fire, but at the beginning of the pandemic when we were all, you know, internet arguing with each other, um, somebody brought up Fauci. And they were like, Fauci thinks he's so smart. Where was Fauci before? Why are we just now hearing about him? Like, why would I ever? He's shown me nothing. He's shown me no proof. He's shown me no evidence, which wasn't true. I don't think. But anyway, but I remember saying to somebody like, well, why don't you just believe? Why don't you just believe? You don't need evidence. You don't need proof. Why don't you just believe? And they were like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. (laughs) Huh. Excellent is technique. it now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, why don't you just believe him? He seems like he seems like a good dude. He seems, I mean, he looks like he he's, you know, trustworthy, I think. Why don't you just believe? Why do you need to see all this evidence? Why, like, we're good at that, right? We just believe. <laughs> and I, I didn't make a lot of friends doing that. But um, so now I would like to talk a little bit about your book. You have this book that came highly recommended to me. Um, It's called The Illusion of God's Presence. Tell me about that. Tell me about the research there, the the motivation. How did that book come to be? Sure. Um, I wrote that book. um, That's my first book. Um, I started writing it, like I said, around 2007. But um, I had had that book in some form, any some vague form. It had been in the back of my head for decades. I started actually thinking about writing such a book when I was in graduate school. Wow. Um, And I was um, 
I was in a, in a lab at UCSD uh, run by Ted Bullock is his name, Theodore, Theodore Bullock. Uh, he died around 2005, I think. But um, at the time, he was highly regarded as one of the founding fathers of what's called neuroethology. <clears throat> and I should digress a little bit and explain what ethology is. Ethology is the study of behavior in its natural context. So ethologists are interested in um, not a, la a lab rat pressing a lever in a box. They're interested in uh, a herring gull chick on the, in its nest in the wild, just after it, after it hatches out. It, it, it seeks out its parents' bill. It knows what its parents' head looks like. And it knows there's a red spot on the tip of the bill that it should peck at. And when it does that, then the, the parent will feed it. So <laughs> all of that is built in. So that's the kind of thing ethologists are interested in. Um, in, the, in the lab I was working in, um, we did experiments on a whole lot, mostly marine animals, mostly fishes of various kinds. Um, and my thesis was on something like that. But the, the point of neuroethology is that the brain is so complicated that it's our only hope of understanding it is to find some place in a brain where you completely understand the problem it's trying to solve. And we can best do that if we, if we study the brains of animals that are highly specialized for a very specific behavior where we've, we've studied the behavior a lot, we know what, what, why it's there, what, it, what purpose it serves in the animal's reproductive success. And, and once we get to that point, then we can go in the brain and try to figure out how the brain does this thing. So that's neuroethology. And um, it's, it's made lots of great uh, strides in, and some famous examples are uh, sensing and communication and navigation with electric fields and, and weekly, weekly electric fish, um, the development of song and songbirds, development of wow. sexual pair bonding in monogamous prairie voles, um, the ability of a barn owl to catch prey in total darkness using only sound cues. Wow. These, these, these are the kinds of things that neuroethology concerns itself with. So, um, so I was, this was at a time when I was far enough along in science and far, and far enough away from my childhood that I was starting to look back on it and, and look back on my religiousness and my parents' religiousness. And, and I was starting to think about it as a puzzle. Uh, you know, it's not just me and it's not just my parents. Most humans do this in, in one way or another. Religion is pretty ubiquitous, ubiquitous across cultures. Right. So, so why do humans do this? And, and I started to think of it through this lens of neuroethology that there is part of religion, not all of it, but part of it is very infantile in its characteristics. God is seen as a parental figure, and we describe our, ourselves as children of God. Right. In Christianity, you're taught that you have to be born again, become yes. an, an infant again to enter the kingdom of heaven and all of that. So there's a lot of infantile imagery in religion and a lot of infantile emotion in it. And when you pray, especially when you pray in desperation, you're, you're like an infant crying out to mother yes, to, to be fed, to be rescued, to be kept warm, whatever. Well, this infantile behavior, like I said, is, is one of the kinds of things that neuroethologists are attracted to. A lot of the, not all of it, but a lot of neuroethology research is on newly hatched chicks or, or newly hatched sea turtles or whatever. Young animals, where whatever behavior they do, you know it must be innate because they haven't had any time for learning. They hatch out and immediately do it. So yeah. that's you know that's something that evolution has selected for, and and that that's very attractive to to ethologists. So I thought there was something like that, something very infantile about religion, and that that it it could explain some of the, of the puzzles of religion. And one of those puzzles is this feeling of, of the sense of God's presence that many religious people describe. 
if you have a, a debate with a religious person, go through all of their theological points that they think are true, like original sin or whatever, and you shoot them down as being irrational, self-contradictory, whatever, eventually you get to the point where they say, okay, fine, you, you can make all those arguments, but you'll never convince me that Jesus isn't real because I have personally felt the presence of Jesus. I know God is real because I felt his presence. And, and they say that, a lot of them, out of true sincerity. It's, a, oh, yeah. it's, it's something that many people have felt. And I have had that kind of feeling myself at, at several times. Absolutely. Um, so even after becoming an atheist, even many years after losing my religious belief, I've had this sense presence illusion. Yeah, absolutely. In moments of, of emotional turmoil. So um, that aroused my curiosity. And I thought that that kind of thing could be explained in terms of an infant's longing for its mother. I, was, I, I started to feel that there was something innate here, that, that human infants are born with some innate circuitry, just like a, a herring gull chick is born with circuitry that tells it there's, a, there's another bird out there, it's, it's bigger than you, it has a head that's shaped like this, it has a red spot on its bill, you have to connect with it, you have yeah. to interact with it, this is what you have to do. Yep, yep. All, all that was there by virtue of evolution, and I was suggesting, or at least thinking, before I started writing it, that something like that may be going on in humans, that we have an innate neural model of a, of a human mother. Right. It's, it's, it's not a specific image of a specific person. It's just a vague sense that a, a primordial savior exists out there. And this being will respond to you. It knows what you need. It, it wants to help and, and it will help when it hears you cry out for help. So it views you as a child. It refers yes. to you as a child. Absolutely. Yes. And this is just sort of the skeleton of the infant's model of the mother, which very quickly after birth gets fleshed in with learned information about a real person who does interact with it, respond to the cries, provide food and nourishment and warmth and all of that. So if we have this innate circuitry, and if it persists into adulthood, but sort of lies dormant, then in an adult, under conditions of extreme helplessness and desperation, conditions that sort of mimic the helplessness of infancy, this circuitry could get activated. And when it does, then the person gets this vague sense of the presence of a, of a, of a savior, of a, of a vague being out there somewhere who, will, who loves you, who knows you, who responds to your cries, and that is interpreted as an adult, very often, as the presence of God, because by that time, you've learned about, through, through your culture, you've learned about the attributes of God. God knows everything. God is loving. God is powerful. God wants to save you and help you and all this stuff. And so, God just naturally plugs into that hole that is originally there to make us connect with our mothers as infants. So that's the essence of that's the essence of the idea. Yeah, it's almost like evolution is the reason you can believe in religion. It's almost yes. like the very thing that religious people think that they they want to prove wrong is the thing that gives them the ability to believe in a yes. god or the that's interesting. That's very very interesting. And do you think do you think that belief itself just like the very idea of the feeling or thought of belief. Do you think that that is also something manufactured by the human mind? Like, do you say, for example, I say, I believe that pink is my favorite color, or I believe that foxes are the best animal. Do you think there is something in my brain that is different than, say, for example, somebody who believes that dogs are the best animal and blue is the best color? Or do you think that belief and, and, um, ideas like that and opinions can change because of a person's actual decisions. Oh yeah, I definitely think I think things like that can change. Um, I think things like that are are are, are you know subject to 
to learning and choices and stuff like that. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but your question reminded me of, of a discussion I've had with some religious people that um, they will sometimes tell you that belief in God is a choice, that you, um, you get to choose whether or not you're a Christian. You get to choose whether or not you believe God exists. Yep. So why not make the right choice? Right. The one that I have made, which is to believe in God. Um, but for someone, you see, that only works. That really only applies if you shut down the things we were talking about earlier, the skepticism, right. the, the dependence on evidence and, and probabilistic thinking, all of that stuff. If you shut that down, then, then anything is an opinion or everything is an opinion. There's no distinction between matters of fact, between objective reality and matters of opinion. So I've, I've had this problem when trying to discuss, for example, the 2020 election with people that, you know, how, how do you believe that, that Trump won the election? How do you know this? Right. And how do you distinguish what's true from what's false in all of these claims right. that are being made on both sides? And, and they will just say, oh, well, that's up to each individual person. That's a matter of opinion. And I, I try to explain to them, no, 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 it's Vo votes can be counted. They're a number. It's an yeah. integer. <laughs> I don't think it's it's an opinion whether or not somebody cheated or not. I don't think that's an opinion. And I don't think it's an opinion whether or not they were proved wrong. I think that's, I think we've, that's fact. I think that's it, fact. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. yes, there, you, r religious thinking really muddles your ability to distinguish truth from falsehood. Yes, absolutely. And do you think that there is, or have you found that there is a difference in the brain of somebody who believes in religion versus does not? Is there any kind of different like pathway there? I, I don't know the correct terminology. I'm an English major, but mm -hmm. um, like, is there a way that their brain was built that you can almost like predetermine that they will kind of fall down that more susceptible rabbit hole than somebody who is a skeptic or more science-based or something like that. I'm going to switch on my light here so it doesn't get too dark when I'm listening. Your question reminds me of some experiments I've read about. Um, they're neuroimaging experiments um, where, um, where they've they present people, this, this was actually done by Sam Harris um, when he was a graduate student. Um, they present people with statements of fact or, or statements that, you know, look like they're statements of fact. And, and some of them are obviously true and some of them are obviously false. Um, some of them are religiously themed and some of them are non-religious or secular in, in, in content. And what they did was they, they would ask the subjects to respond true or false to these statements while doing neuroimaging, while looking at what's going on in their brain in, in fMRI, and, and try to look for exactly the kind of thing you're getting at. Is there a difference in what's going on in the brain of someone who does believe in God versus someone who doesn't when they're answering these questions about religiousness? So the interesting thing is that they, they could not see an obvious difference between these non-religious statements or people's responses to non-religious statements versus religious statements that um, in any one person, they seem to be handled in the same way. But there were, there were other studies where um, when, they, when people were Confront it was it was a similar kind of study, and I can't remember who did this one, but I talk about it in my book. It's in there. It's in there somewhere. I, I have the reference for it in there somewhere. Um, you could see a difference in that when you were asked, asked, making a statement that seemed to be, in some way, a challenge to religion, like um, the Prophet Muhammad never existed, something like that. If you were not a Muslim, 
people people's brain pattern looked one way, and if you were a Muslim, it would look different. And and the differences were in areas having to do with emotional reactions that it looked like they were they were getting upset. You could sort of see interesting air, de, the defensiveness in yeah. their in the brain start to get activated in the what was commonly called limbic areas of the brain. Um, that you did not see in someone who had no d- dog in that fight, who wasn't a Muslim. Interesting. So, so, um, hmm. so the, I guess the short answer to your question is, yes, there are some differences that can be seen with the right kind of stimulus. And I, I think it's interesting the ties that we can make between religion and politics. I feel like it's not just in this country, but I feel like it's very prominent in this country right now. Um, I was talking to somebody about uh, recently about debate and how when you debate a skeptic or when you debate someone who is, say, for example, like further on the left side, um, you can ask them, you know, why do you believe this? Or maybe somebody moderate, like, why do you believe this? And they'll give you a reason that is why they believe it, whether it's something they saw, whether it's something they read, whether it's something they heard, even if what they heard isn't true, they'll give you like a concrete reason as to why it is they believe that thing or don't believe in God or don't believe in religion. And when you ask a question like that, a very innocent question, just a please show me an example of why you are far right or why you are evangelical or why you are heavily Catholic. A lot of times the response is an attack on something else as opposed to a reason. Like, why do you follow Donald Trump? Well, it's better than following Hillary because she's a no good this, that, the other. And you're like, okay, but that doesn't really, what what reason do you have for being a Christian, right? Well, you know, those Muslims, because they, this, that, the other, it's never a or it's rarely, I should say, a very specific reason to support their choice. It's a reason to dog on somebody else's choice that they made who's different. And I've also noticed that people that are more open-minded will take a question that you ask them. And if they don't know, they'll say, that's a really good question. I don't know. I've never really thought about that. Or my opinion on that matter is this, or I consider this. Whereas the other side, usually evangelical, usually far-right individuals, if you just ask them why, they view it as an attack and they immediately attack back. And I just think that's so interesting that so many people out there are existing in this plane, whether it's mental or, or emotional, where just being asked not even to prove, just being asked to explain why it is that they wrap their entire lives around a certain thing that's an attack and that's an insult and they should be scared or upset by that and i I feel like that kind of goes in line with what you just said where it's like are you this religion are you that religion you know do you believe in this do you believe in that and like the upset that people may not even physically show but mentally experience when they are questioned or when they are accused in their mind of something that goes against what they want to believe and i say that because i don't in my core i don't believe that religion is a choice for people um i believe at the point where you tell somebody when they don't pick something they're going to be tortured forever in a fiery pit of hell you've taken their choice away um because yeah. people say you know oh well at least i don't choose to be christian at least i don't choose to be religious i don't think it's a choice and i actually have a lot of empathy for people who are religious because i know how scary that can be um i recently read an article about um about uh, it was, I forget the term for it, but it was basically the constant fear of revelations and the constant fear of the second coming and the the second coming of the Satan and Christ, like taking rapture. That's there, that's the word I was thinking of, rapture yeah, yeah. fear. And so I, I, while I don't think that it is a choice to believe something, because once you've been told that your options are not great, if you don't believe it, I do think it is a choice to ask questions. And it is a choice to decide why it is that you believe that thing and to have good evidence and to allow conversations and to allow people, if it was a true choice, I don't think their brains would react that way when they're questioned or when they're opposed 
if it was a true choice to be a part of that faith, um, I think they would respond as calmly as somebody who doesn't believe there's a God. But because yeah. anybody who is, I mean, I, I hate to use this word because it is so loaded, but be, anybody who is groomed to believe a certain way, I think that everybody secretly in the back of their minds thinks that they're the only one in the environment that's questioning stuff that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So they're all just doing it. I told my friend, you know, if you get if you get somebody who's like a super duper duper right wing conservative Republican or somebody who is super evangelical in a room, because I've done this, I only know this because I've literally done this, they will slowly start to mention little things here and there that they don't actually believe, but they just don't want to cause a ruckus. So they just go with it. And I think we're all like that. I think everybody, no matter how devout you are, I think you've had that moment where you're like, am I the, I think I'm the only one who thinks that I'm just going to keep it to myself. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to be like, mm, I'm just going to sit here and sing the hymn, but that did, did that make sense to anybody else? And I feel like it, people go two directions with those. They either decide, as in my case, um, oh, wow, the more I look into this, I don't actually agree with any of this. I've been identifying because at one time, believe it or not, believe it or not, can I call you Jack? Believe it or sure. not, Jack, I was a conservative Republican Baptist girl. Uh -huh. <laughs> but that's because when people would ask me why, I would just get defensive and I would stop hanging out with them and be like, oh, they're trying to lead me astray. They're trying to lead me down to the devil. And it's like, no, first of all, they're they're really nice people and they have a great time. Um, but also I remember the the day that I realized I didn't actually believe a lot of the conservative Republican things that I thought that I did. And I didn't actually believe in God. And I had had those questions kind of brewing in my mind for a long time. And I was just lucky enough to have the opportunity to explore that side and research that side and question that side and live in an environment where I was allowed to then choose that side, a true choice, as opposed to a lot of people who I, I honestly mourn for, who probably have a very similar experience to me where they wake up one day and they're like, I'm not this, I'm not that. But if I say anything, I lose everyone that I love. I lose everything I've ever worked for. I lose every one of those familial village connections I've ever had. So instead, I'm just going to stay quiet and I'm just going to sing the hymns and I'm just going to go to Sunday school and do what I got to do to stay part of the yeah. fold. It's hard to be a truth seeker. To, be a tr to really be a truth seeker, meaning that you, you put the truth above everything else, you, you 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 have to you have to want the truth so much that you're willing to put at risk things like you just listed your Absolutely. your family relationships your 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 marriage your your social connections all of that you could yeah. lose if you discover <laughs> that the thing you've been believing all these years is false yeah um, and another thought that this conversation has led me to is. Um, is a, is a way that I sometimes like to describe my my feeling about belief in God now as a as a scientist of my age who's had a lot of time to think about it and who has done a lot of writing on the subject and reading on the subject um, and and had the insight of the thought experiment of smashing the calculator and all that stuff. Um, it's no longer a choice for me. I could not choose to believe in God. In the same way that an astronaut who has seen the Earth from space cannot choose to believe the Earth is flat. Right. At most, he could only pretend to believe the Earth right. is flat. And, right. And, and this, it's the same with me. At most, I could only pretend to believe in God because I, I know that this, these ideas can't be true. They, they. Pick any specific religion, and there are lots of good reasons for, for shooting that down, because most religious doctrines are shot through with self-contradiction. Yes, but, yes. But even, but even if you get away with all of that, do away with all of that, and you just require that belief in God involves some supernatural, vague being not associated with any religion, um, even that I cannot believe in, because... Um, 
I, I require evidence. I, I need yeah. some evidence. And yes. it, I, I won't completely say that that's a, such a thing is impossible, but the idea is useless because it's scientifically untestable. It makes no predictions. I can't test it. So it's meaningless. There's a universe of untestable fantasies that we can come up with. Right. And, and they are all equally unworthy of belief because you can't test them. You can't distinguish <laughs> one from the other as being more likely or less likely. Yes. Yes. So, so, um, so why waste your time with any of them? So that's, yes. <laughs> that, that's why I can't believe in, in God. And I have lots of neuroscientific reasons not to believe in an afterlife that, you know, our, our existence, our consciousness, our minds come from the brain. And when the brain mm -hmm. dies, we do, we go with it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of times also people who are religious think that people who are not religious assume that Christians or religious people are stupid or that they're dumb. And I, I try to tell them, you know, I don't think religious people are stupid. Take, for example, my mom. She's one of the most brilliant people that I know. She's one of the most intelligent people that I think exist. Um, she is getting her PhD. She's one of those people where no matter what you say, you can literally say like, oh, there was, did you hear there was a car crash in Springdale earlier? She's Googling it. And if she's proven you wrong, she's going to show you. She's going to be like, <laughs> this is not true. Like she's one of those, it's infuriating when you get proven wrong, but she, and she taught me so much about research, about independence, about thinking on your own using your brain, you know, don't just fall for anything. Like she really, uh, I was a debater for many years and she drove into my head, like research, know what you're talking about, have facts, have evidence, save everything, you know, know why you say things you say. And if you don't know what you're talking about, don't say it, keep your mouth closed. And yet I know that if I were to try to approach her with this sort of conversation about God and about Jesus, she would be devastated that I don't believe she would be devastated that I'm not a Christian. And to me, it's just wild that this is a woman who is, she's getting her PhD. Like her whole life is about not just having sources, but having 15 of them and being able to cite them off the top of your head and being able to find like plot holes and loopholes. And, and she's proven me wrong, like 700 times in my life on just little things, like whether or not, you know, there's cheddar in a cheese stick or whatever, she's got to be right. But it's just so interesting that you're like, okay, prove that God exists. And it's like, oh, you're, you're telling me that you don't believe in God anymore. Like, woof, you've got problems. You know, that's, that's a big issue. Like I'll pray for you. And you're just like, yeah. hmm, like this woman has changed political parties based on the research that she's done. And she still has that same kind of fence built up around even the conversation, even if at the end of the day, she wanted to stay a Christian at least like having that conversation would be just like a step in a wild direction that we've never taken. And I'm just, I guess I'm lucky. She doesn't listen to podcasts. <laughs> She's proud yeah. of me, but she doesn't listen to podcasts. She doesn't like them. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, well, you know, that's a possibly a, she may be an example of, of someone who has had that, feeling of God's presence that she's had what she considers a personal connection with, with a real God, so real, so close. She could reach out and touch him literally and, mm -hmm. and, and, and has that feeling. And it's, it's so compelling that it, you, when, when I have had those illusions myself um, and when I was writing my book about it, I actually came to feel great empathy for for believers, because I know how real it feels. And I can see how if you are in a moment of despair and desperation and helplessness, that it can, it can, it can be a salvation in a way, it can give you hope, it can keep you going, it can, can give you a reason to keep going. And, and I, and I understand how important it is to people. I don't yeah. want to take it, I don't want to take it away from them. Right. If it, me, if, it if it's what they need to, to, get through the through the night but um if you want to seek truth if you want to if you want to know what's true then then that takes courage and it and it may take giving up something that you are that deeply attached to yeah there's absolutely i've mentioned this before on my podcast but there's absolutely that mourning period where you're like none of this is real 
there's nothing like I'm not going to see these people again who have passed away, who I care so much about. I'm not going to get to party in heaven. I'm not going to get to, you know, sing with the the angels or whatever it is that people happen to believe. You know, it's it's not a ha ha like God's not real. Bam, bam, bam. You know, like y'all are a bunch <laughs> of losers. It's it's more of a are you it's like when you get to an event and it's such a letdown and you're like, oh. Man, I mean, I guess it's nice. I'll get a lot of sleep, I guess, just being unconscious for the rest of eternity, but <laughs> none of it's real. Like, you know, and and so there is like that mourning period. And then I feel like after that comes the kind of piece you were describing where it's just like, so it's literally over. Like, I don't have to go to work. I don't have to check in anywhere. I don't have to answer any questions at a gate. I can just, I can just be dead. Oh, nice. Like kind of a little bit. I don't know. Maybe that's a little morbid way to think about it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just tired. I think I said all that to say I'm just exhausted. Yeah. But well, I I just realized I just looked at the clock and realized I've kept you a half hour beyond what I said that I would. Um, I've just really enjoyed having this conversation, and I think you're a fascinating person. If there was any message, any kind of one message you could send listeners with today, whether it's about your research, whether it's about their feelings on, um, I was about to say disassociating, uh, on deconstructing, what would you want people to take away from this episode? I would say that um, we we have always, as humans, we have always tended to, when, whenever we're, there's something happening around us in the world that we don't understand, we've, we've tended to put some kind of supernatural force or a God in it to explain it. So when it's thunder and lightning and storms and all of that, we say, oh, that's Thor. Thor is angry. That, that's what that is. Uh, and that's the God of the gaps. We, whenever there's a gap in our understanding of the natural world or of reality, we, we plug God into that. And that kind of God has been shrinking in the last few hundred years because science has filled in those gaps, most of them. But we still have some gaps that have not yet been filled in. And, and one of them is this feeling of God's presence, this that we've been talking about, this, this compelling sensation that there is this amorphous, loving being just out of reach, or maybe enfolding me, taking care of me, wanting to rescue me from my desperation. That feeling is the probably the last refuge of the God of the gaps. And even the most skeptical, brilliant scientists that we have, scientists like Francis Collins, can be seduced by that illusion. And so I'm very empathetic to that. But if you are a, a real truth seeker, um, I have a book on that subject and I recommend it. <laughs> uh, I, I, will, I will show you how I think that can be explained in a completely natural way, and we no longer need to put God in that particular gap. Yeah. <clears throat> and, excuse me, we started out talking about my first book. I should just briefly mention that I have a new one that just came out. Yes, and I will link it in the description so they can check it, it out. It's, it's on a, the, basically the same subject of, uh, that we've been discussing, the illusion of God's presence. But the phantom god specifically explores um, the neuroscience of that question. What is it that we can learn from looking at the brain of, of humans and maybe of animals too? What, is it, what can we learn about why we are religious and how we are religious and where this feeling of a presence comes from? So that's what the new book is about. Yeah. So don't be afraid to ask those questions. And to learn, don't don't let ideas that other people have told you just kind of cease your curiosity, you know, because even I tell people, even if at the end of the day, you decide that you still believe what you believed before, at least you know now why you believe it. Yeah. At least you know, at least you can feel comfortable knowing that you made that decision yourself. But at the same time, I'd be curious to see if you still believed it after exploring certain angles. And maybe that's that's what they don't want you to know. That's what they don't want you to know. But um, well, thank you so much, Dr. John Wathy, everybody. Um, Jack, as I feel like very privileged to get to call you. Um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I did not mean to keep you so late. I just was 
really enjoying this conversation. Um, I'll link your book, both of them in the description so that people can find it. If you don't mind, I'll link the videos that you sent me as well, if that's okay. Sure, sure, um, fine. That way people can just listen to the speeches that you've given and the talks that you've given. I would love to talk to you sometime about cults. I know we talked about cults earlier. That would be well, something if you're ever sure. down to appear again. Um, but other than that, I really appreciate you. I appreciate your work. I appreciate your research. And most of all, your time for my podcast. Oh, I'm, I'm grateful. I, I didn't know what time it was either. I was enjoying the conversation just as much as you. I'm truly grateful you had me on. And, and I would love to come back and have another chat with you sometime. And the cults, talking about cults would be a good topic. We could start off with that next time. Excellent. But, um, thank you very much for this. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.